All right, so welcome everyone to the Geek Group, and uh, thank you all for being here on this, uh, Some for some of us, late evening. Thank you for that. Um, we start off with a, a brief disclaimer here. Topics, properties, and investments discussed are for educational purposes only. We do not sell securities. Each investor is responsible for their own decisions and must evaluate investments according to their investment risk tolerances. Opinions expressed are those of speakers and no one else. And so with that said, I'm going to move to the introduction of our guest speaker, who I am very excited to have tonight. Uh, this is the introduction for Steve O'Brien. He is a co-founder and the president of Arcan Capital, which owns and operates apartments in the southeastern United States. Mr. O'Brien is responsible for the identification, acquisition, management, and reporting of over 30 multifamily assets, totaling over $400 million in the last five years including the placement of over $250 million in financing with Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, HUD, and bank and insurance sources. Prior to Arcan, Mr. O'Brien was with CBRE. During his career in commercial real estate, Mr. O'Brien participated in the acquisition, financial structuring, underwriting, management, and sale of several billion dollars worth of assets in all major product types, including multifamily, office, retail, industrial, and residential. Mr. O'Brien attended at Emory University's, it's, I think, Gozueta Business School and is licensed as a licensed real estate broker in four states. So I personally, through the Geek Group and our partners, have had the privilege to work with Steve for quite some number of years, and I'm super excited to have you on the call, Steve. So at this point, go ahead and, and take it away. Thank you, everybody, for having me. Um, uh, it is actually really nice uh, to be here. We have a long relationship um, with Max and team. And um, thank you guys for having me tonight. Uh, I am also getting over COVID. So I apologize for random coughing and sounding like maybe I'm a little underwater. Um, <clears throat> but uh, doing, doing fine now. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit today and, and Max obviously wants you to be able to guide me in any direction you want to go. But um, Arkin Capital, as Max mentioned, we're, we're an owner operator. And um, what that basically means is not only are we a sponsor and the GP, but we also manage all of the properties. So there's really nothing that we don't do. Um, in addition to doing that for our own account, we property manage for a very select few clients that, that see the world the same way we do. Um, and we also asset manage. And so one of the things I wanted to talk about today was the, the difference between the two and the, the thin wall or thin line that exists um, between those two functions. Um, we, we have a lot of investors that invest with us that are very familiar with how to operate an asset from a from a big perspective and from the top, but not as familiar on the ground and, and also vice versa. We, we know a lot of people that are very good at running the day to day of the assets, but a lot of the bigger picture can elude them. So I thought I would talk about that a little bit and then open up for more questions that, that um, anybody may have and spend some more time on that. So. What, what I would say is it's almost like uh, any organization looking at it from the ground up. And what's unique about multifamily, I think, is you have, you know, three different types of firms and, the, you know, the one type of firm just manages the property. The other type of firm just asset manages property and the other type of firm does both. And we're one that does both. And what's fascinating about that to me is I don't think there's really a clear distinction between those two functions. Um, I can't, I, I always kind of say it's, you know, at what point does something become asset management versus property management? I can't tell you, but I know it when I see it. Um, you know, frequently as a property manager, you are dealing with the core functions of, of operating property, which is collections, it's maintenance, um, and, uh, you know, taking care of the physical asset. And where that line typically changes from property management to asset management is uh, bigger picture ownership decisions about the property. So one of the things that we think is most important when distinguishing between an asset manager, a property manager and operating between the two is to have a clear definition of your expectations of your property manager and, and what 
um, your property manager will be doing for you, what you will be doing as an asset manager, uh, because there are firms like ours that, uh, you know, we have clients that come to us and say, all we want you to do is property manage. We're going to tell you exactly where we want the rents. We're going to tell you exactly what the value add program is. Uh, we're going to supervise it. Uh, we're going to tell you what, um, you know, we want to call the property. We're going to tell you what we want the website to look like. And we have other asset managers who basically hand the property to us and say, go, what, what should we do? Should we renovate the units? Should we fix the roof? We're trusting you to basically make every decision. And if you don't have a clear defined relationship with your property manager or your asset manager, or either, if you're just an investor, I think that's one of the most important things to know and understand and ask is, okay, let's say there's a problem with the loan. Who's handling that? Because generally that's not something your property manager is going to handle. Um, let's say that, uh, you know, you're doing value add renovations and it turns out that you don't need um, just a new roof. You also need new windows. How do we handle that? You know, who's responsible for identifying that? Um, and uh, if there's a major decision to be made, how do you make that decision? Ultimately, <clears throat> excuse me, the operating agreement is going to dictate on the ownership side who makes that decision. But frequently we've been in positions where uh, sometimes, you know, the property manager and asset manager and owner are all on a phone call or sitting and they're all pointing at one another saying, whose decision is this? Or why didn't this get done? I think is the bigger issue is it's pretty easy when you need a new roof to all get together and go, hey, we got to fix this roof. But the bigger question is, you know, you have a value add property and you want to do a bunch of unit interior renovations and drive additional rent. And your property manager is saying, well, who's going to design? Who's going to pick the granite? Who's going to pick the paint color? Who's going to pick the fixtures? And the asset manager is saying you and the properties manager is saying, well, we don't normally do that. You normally do that. And so I think it's one of the main things that we focus on when we're getting into a deal is roles and responsibilities. Who's going to do what? and where those responsibilities lie. Because I, I think you would be surprised at how often things don't get done and people are left in a room pointing fingers at one another, not even aggressively, just saying, I thought you were doing it. Well, I thought you were going to do it. And there's a lot to do on a property in that gray area um, between, as I mentioned, you know, financing is almost always an asset manager owner responsibility. And nobody really would ever argue that the asset manager is supposed to be collecting the rents but there's a large portion of activities and responsibilities that <clears throat> fall in the middle. Excuse me. So I think um, ARC and Capital that, that does both, we, we find that it's a huge benefit to be vertically, vertically integrated because we can clearly delineate our asset management from our property management. So the way that our firm is structured is with a property management division on one side and an asset to manage management division on the other side. And so when we're making asset management decisions, we have one team and we include the property management and we're making property management decisions. We include the asset management team and uh, in the property management decisions so that you're getting that communication, which is the key to everything and making sure that your plans are followed. Um, I, I think when, uh, as, as someone who not only invests in assets, but also buys them for my own account and for other investors, I think some of the most important questions we ask when going into a deal as an investor is about that structure. So, you know, who's in charge, who's making the decisions on a, on a top down level, um, as specific as I always brought up, I brought up before financing uh, from a capital budget perspective, who is the person that is making sure that if your budget calls for 50 units to be renovated in the first year, who is getting on the phone every two weeks or every month and looking at the pro property manager and saying, all right, 50 units this year, you should be averaging about four a month. How many are you doing? Um, and if not, why not? And I think that's really an asset management function. And what we've found is if you're not actively reviewing those reports, whether they're weekly, monthly from your property manager and asking those questions and coming up with a strategy for the property manager, whether it's a massive property management group, you know, like a gray star or a smaller group like us, if you're not there asking those questions and figuring out 
exactly what is being done on a day-to-day -day basis and what the goals of the property management company are, I think you're going to find that they will not be met nearly as quickly or as effectively. Um, and from the same point, um, you know, property managers are, are, are busy like everyone else. And I, I don't want to be critical of them, but I, I will be very candid and, and tell you that we got into this business as just an investor. And the reason that we developed a property management division was because we found it was very difficult to hold a property management. And we had an institutional property management group, a large group with 10,000 units. And we found it very hard to hold them accountable for value add work. And, um, you know, we're in the multifamily business. So just to make a little multifamily joke, um, we're, I'm actually looking at an investment in a 2020 asset that was delivered in Texas. And it's a value add investment. And I, I laugh when I say that because there's basically nothing that you can find right now that's not value add. And value add, though it's been around for a long time, it was really perfected this cycle. People weren't selling every unit as a value add, or every property as a value add property prior to this cycle. And very few property management firms have 20 years of value add property management experience. And so what that basically means is if you think you're going to do a value add and improve the property and change the branding and, you know, whether it's new windows, new siding, new roofing, new interiors, new leasing office, new fitness center, et cetera, and you're going to rely on your property manager to do that, you, you need to make sure that they don't just have 20 years of property management experience, but that they have experience doing value add. Um, we've worked with and taken over properties from very experienced property management groups that have not been able to execute a value add because it's almost a completely different muscle to flex than simply managing the property. Some of the best property managers we have in our portfolio really struggle with unit interior renovations, really struggle with value add properties. We're, you know, we're building a leasing office right now. And that is something that is completely handled from our corporate office. And even though that's a very typical value add improvement, um, just building, you know, a 1500 square foot leasing office, that is not something that your average property manager or even property management company really has the expertise to do. Now, many do and have a, uh, you know, renovation specialists and engineers and, and on staff. But when push comes to shove, I think one of the things that's really important to know is that generally the people who are looking after an asset are the property manager on site and the maintenance staff on site. And it takes a good amount of effort to get the rest of the group in property management there to focus on those, what you would consider value add improvements or value add changes. And there are some groups that really focus on it, really specialize in it. And there are some groups that it's basically lip service for. Um, and I think knowing the difference between the two when you have a property manager uh, is very valuable. Um, we've recently made the transition and uh, Max knows this, we've done some investing uh, we started our business in 2012, and when we started, we were very, very workforce in nature. We were we were buying um, across the board, anything from C all the way up to A, but we focused on really tertiary markets. And as the market grew on, we found that the returns that we were trying to get were really only available in Class C deals with a heavy value add upside. So we got a lot of experience doing that, but. Uh, what we found is, you know, class C deals with a heavy value add are substantially more difficult to manage and made even more difficult in an environment like the pandemic where collections are tougher and tougher. And so what we've actually done through our course of ownership is from our experience on the ground and the difficulty managing a property, we've transitioned the focus of our investment strategy from, from lower end workforce housing and secondary and tertiary locations to higher end workforce housing and even class A urban wrap in better markets with less delinquency because as cap rates have compressed um we do not believe that there's enough of a spread between what it costs everything is expensive right now but we do not believe that there's enough of a spread between the really low end much harder to manage much harder to operate assets and the much higher end assets it feels like everything's trading in the threes from a cap rate perspective in in the atlanta and southeastern area so if I'm going to pay for really, really expensive things, I'm going to get something nice. And that's a strategy that we developed because we are running the day to day on these properties every single day. And we're seeing how much harder it is to manage the workforce, lower end, lower rental housing versus the higher end housing. And so 
having that connection between asset management and property management can also really help you determine an investment strategy because as a property manager, I can tell you, even though we do it and we'll always do it, the industry is broken and it's broken because you get 3% no matter what. And 3% of uh, $750 in rent on hundred units is a lot less than 3% of $2,000 a unit and collecting is substantially harder when people are paying 750 than when they're paying $2,000 a month. So the way, the reason I say it's broken, and even though as the units, as the properties get bigger, that asset or property management fee does sometimes drop. But the reality is it is, it is more profitable and easier to run nicer class A assets. And so as you're out there um, looking at assets and looking at property managers, I think those are some of the really important things to consider and, and look at and make sure that the bases between those two are covered, the connections are covered, and that you have the right people in place communicating the right way. Um, because it's, it's as, as we've seen jumping into it in the last two or three years, particularly with the pandemic, operating a multifamily property has, has never been harder. And that um, requires additional attention and support, not only from your property management team, but also from the asset management team. And we've seen, we've seen a lot from our investors, uh, both passive investors and active investors, um, that uh, they're sometimes unaware of how important that connection is and the accountability uh, of your property managers and expertise of your property managers and, and making sure that there is that communication and that link between the goals of the asset manager and the investor and what the property manager's expertise is, what their goals are and what their expectation of, of results on the property is as well. Um, and that goes top to bottom from, as I mentioned, collecting rents, value add improvements all the way to having discussions on returns with a property manager. I think, I think many people would be surprised at how little some property managers consider yield on investment or IRR in the way that they manage an asset. They have a kind of management in a box, if you will, and they take that management in a box. And even if it's very effective, they apply that management in a box to every property that they take over. And it may be incredibly effective on a B asset in a suburban market, but it may be incredibly ineffective on a heavy value add C asset in a transitional neighborhood. So that's, um, I think, what I wanted to point out and, and discuss here today and, and um, also wanted to be uh, leave some time open here, Max, for, for you and team to ask some more questions and, and lead me down whatever road might be best for you. Got it. So you're doing fine on time. You still have probably another 20, 30 minutes if you so decide. If I could interject some questions here, and it might lead us down some different paths. Um, I want to give the group an idea. I mean, you, you up and I, you know, uh, I don't I don't think you always sell yourself when, when we hear those numbers in your bio. I don't think we realize how big they are. So give us some stats, like how many employees are in your firm right now? Uh, about 90. Uh, 11 right. corporate staff and 79 property level employees. We have 18 assets and over 3000 units. Got it. And so I appreciate you saying that because that gives us an idea of, uh, you know, for us in our small group, that's actually quite large for us. So, um, and then uh, out of those 3000 units, uh, some of those are managed for other owners and some of them are managed out of your portfolio. Is there a rough split to that? Or can you tell us that or? How sure. Yeah. No, it's, okay. it's about, it's about 50, 50, um, okay. in it's about 50, 50 in unit number in asset value. It's about 70, 30. Um, okay. we, we operate some class a assets in Atlanta and, and surrounding States, um, that are for out of state investors or uh, family offices. And, and that can range, as, as I mentioned before, part of how we positioned Arkin Capital, and it wasn't in, intentional at first, but it became as, as, as much of a real estate services company as it is an investment company. I'm a real estate investor and, and you know, I, I own a piece of half of those assets. But what we find sometimes is you have very, very wealthy people in family offices 
who are watching what's happening in multifamily and watching and hearing from their friends. And, you know, your average investor um, that's looking to invest in multifamily, maybe they can write a $50,000 check or a hundred thousand dollar check. But if you're worth a hundred or 200 or $300 million writing as crazy as it sounds, writing a hundred thousand dollar check is really not worth your time. And if you're worth $300 million, you can actually afford to own three or four multifamily properties and still be extremely diversified. Uh, so some of those clients come to us and basically say, listen, I have the, the ability to own these much larger assets, but I don't really know how, and I don't really know how to run them. And so we come in and say, okay, um, we can do all of that for you. And with our experience, you know, with Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, HUD, and banks, we can also go get the loans for you based on our expertise uh, and property management. So, um, you know, uh, I'll be careful when I say this, but I said, you know, even if you have $300 million, that doesn't mean Fannie Mae is going to give you, you know, a $10 million loan on an apartment project. It probably is. They'll probably give it to you, but it, these are non-recourse loans and they're going to make you find the right property manager at a minimum and at least prove you know what you're doing. So part of what we've done is step in for some of those family offices and larger groups. And sometimes it's a group of investors. You know, it's a group of 10 or 15 people that can each put a million dollars in. And we run those assets for them as an owner and as a property manager. And some of our other clients are, you know, one of our clients is a, is a large family office out of California that actually has, I think they've got a hundred properties on the West coast, but they're smart enough to know that they don't know how to operate in Atlanta. And so they've hired us to just be a property manager in Atlanta. And we have monthly calls and very detailed connections on what they're trying to approve. And, and again, that's part of what I was talking about. I know exactly what their expectations are. I know exactly what they're trying to execute with their property. And they send me out to go execute that as truly just a property manager. So that's, that's kind of the variation in our portfolio, but generally, I like to say, um, I, and I would tell you what book it's from. I didn't invent it myself, but we we let, we try to treat Arkin like a startup, even though it, it, we've been around for a while because we want to get to the next level of, of things that we do. And, and as a startup, we try to say yes as much as possible. So if somebody comes to us and says, um, within our bandwidth, within something that we think we're good at, will you do this for us? And we think we have the capability to do it and it will be profitable for us. We will say yes. We'll find a way to be creative to get it done. Awesome. And then we've got three hands up. But before we go to David, George, and Darnell, we'll go in that order. Let me just um, reorient everyone. Where are you headquartered and where do you manage properties? We're um, headquartered in Atlanta or Mar Marietta, uh, a small town just outside on the edge of Atlanta, north side of town. Um, I'm born and raised in Atlanta and live in Atlanta and our office is just outside of it. We, I think it's our, our territory is Georgia and any state touching Georgia. Uh, we are currently active in Alabama, Georgia, North Carolina, and South Carolina, uh, but we have been active in Tennessee and Florida previously. And those are the states we like to be in. Um, the Southeast is our bread and butter, uh, you know, as, as the person kind of driving strategy and, and investments, I find it really hard to be an expert in, in just those states, let alone the entire country. So, uh, we focus on our markets in those states, and um, I think we like to say that um, if there's a fire at an asset, we need to know that we can get in the car and be there that day. So that's why we try to stay in that kind of uh, both, I'd say, a literal and a figurative fire. Mm -hmm. So you can hop in your car and go. If you have to fly to an asset, um, I, the current environment is a perfect example. If we had an asset and Michigan and tried to fly and that flight's canceled and that property's burning down while we're just sitting here in Georgia, we think that's a problem. So we try and stay close to our area. Okay, nice. Okay, David, you're up. Uh, Steve, um, you know, you have a lot of experience and previously used with CBRE. So I just want to know what's your thoughts now that we're going into 2022, what's your thoughts on the multifamily market? Um, where do you see us headed? And do you see like a crash coming? What's your thoughts on that? Um, <clears throat> well, I I think uh, to be incredible, as candid as I can be, um, my first answer is I have no idea. Um, but I have some ideas, and I'll tell you why I say I have no idea. I've been wrong for two years. Um, 
I have uh, Arkin Capital raised a fund at the end of 2019, and uh, Max and Ben I, I have, have seen it. I sent it to them, and they'll they'll back me up on this. The our fund was put together to acquire workforce housing in secondary and tertiary markets because we believed something bad was coming. And the reason we believe something bad was coming in 19 is simply because it had been 10 years and about every 10 years, something bad happens. And we didn't know what it would be, but it turned out that right about the time we said something bad was gonna happen, COVID popped up. And I got a lot of phone calls saying, man, you are a genius. Uh, only the problem is um, multifamily values didn't go down at all. They went up. And what you can never predict, you may be able to predict what's going to happen and what's not, but you can never predict how the government's going to react to. So the reason I tell you that story is because I am, I am extremely bullish on multifamily. I think it has proven um, what we always said when we got into it is that everybody needs a place to sleep. And we're even though we are not growing in America as much as we used to, we're still a very healthy place that almost every other country in the world would send people to if they allowed them to just go wherever they wanted. And so we believe that there will be a consistent demand for places for people to sleep in our country. And that's what makes multifamily a great place to invest. That doesn't mean that it's not overpriced. And it doesn't mean that there's not too much capital attracted to it that's been attracted by the oversized returns of the last decade. Um, and I think that's probably where we are today. Um, having said that with what the government's doing in printing money and the inflation that it's caused, typically real estate's exactly where you want to be, uh, in an inflationary environment. My concern is an affordability concern and an asset bubble caused by what it's almost always caused by, which is excess capital and cheap debt. Um, I think if to be very specific, what I think is going to happen in the next year, two years, whenever it happens, and I, that's the part that I'm, I'm done trying to predict the timing. I just think I know eventually what will happen. And that's that, you know, the 10 years is going to go up. It's almost at 1.8 right now, which is the highest it's been in a couple of years. And that means that um, your interest rates are going to go up and your debt is going to go up. And that means your cap rates have to go up. Um, we've got an incredible rent growth in the city of Atlanta. For instance, this cycle rents are up over 50% now, and that's not sustainable for your average person looking for a place to rent. So something's got to happen. And I think what the something's got to happen is, is you're going to get moderate, decent rent growth from here on out. I'm also saying that on the heels of Atlanta having a 10% rent growth here. So that's not necessarily a popular opinion. Uh, but I think rent growth is going to slow down a little bit. And I think um, interest rates are gonna go up and asset values are gonna come down. Is that gonna be a crash? I don't know. I don't know if I think the Fed has proven that they're willing to play as many games as possible to prevent something like that to happen and um, or from happening. And so I, I don't really know, but I think there's no two ways around it. You cannot let costs go up on the average American by 7%. They will it will bankrupt our lower class. And so now the Fed has no choice. They've got to stop it. And they've got to ease back on the bond buying programs and they can't print any more money or it's just going to get worse. And then um, I think as that happens, you will start to see asset prices either stagnate or, or start to come down a little bit. And that's when we think there's going to be another really good opportunity in multifamily again, not necessarily on every asset. Like 2008, it did matter. You know, from 2009 to 2012, it did not matter what you bought. Everybody looked like a genius. And I don't know that that's going to happen again, uh, because that was a, a shaking of our entire financial system, a near collapse of the entire financial system. But I do think there needs to be some, some correction in pricing. Okay, thank you. Nice. Okay, George, you're up, sir. Steve, I just want to tell you I very much appreciated uh, what you presented so far. You speak near and dear to my heart. I want to segue off of what you're talking about, this lower class, and as interest rates rise, what's going to happen there? And I'll start with my question, and I'll preface it with my understanding after that. So my question is this. You've identified with this giant firm that is so much huger than me. I'm, I'm a one man, one brain. Uh, with 30-something years experience in real estate. 
And I have noticed and recognized exactly the same as you. Class A is where the benefits are to be made. My distinction is, is that class A can be in any class. It can be in class A, class B, class C, class C or class D. And right now I'm specifically focusing on developing class A properties in class D neighborhoods because that's where the opportunity zones are and no capital gains. And so I, I'm, my, my ultimate question is, hey, can I do that? Or is, does your experience say that that's impossible? My experience says if I put in a security gate and I create type A style of living in a type D neighborhood where people have, and when I say type A, I don't mean like gold fixtures and stuff like that. I mean like security, family stuff, you know, things that make the it, it enticing to come to. That's where people are going to come because what I'm seeing, and this is my experience with invitation. I say I'm learning a lot. What I'm learning a lot is how really dumb these investors are. Zillow went bankrupt buying homes against invitation or Blackstone to flip them. But Blackstone already bought thousands of homes at one bank from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac at 20% of their value. So they can't compete. So what happened? Zillow went bankrupt. Zillow sold all their homes to invitation. So now invitation sitting here and they're pumping up the market. The market's going up. I see the asset bubble building because they're building it. But I also don't see a big crash that we had in 07, 08 because corporations own a much larger portion of homes in America today than they did before. And they're not going to let it crash. They don't have to let it crash. And kind of as an example to that, I live in an apartment that I want to buy, a complex that I really wanted to buy. It's an at-risk you know, property, whatever, in a very A neighborhood. Um, but the bottom line is, is that when I went and I went to, when I go to try and rent a house now in my neighborhood, to rent a house costs more than my luxury apartment and my storage combined. And that's for the lowest grade house with no renovations. As soon as they go put renovations in, now I'm 20, 30% higher. So my question is, you know, for me, I want win, win, win. I'm tired of searching, searching, searching. And so I've been focusing on the building and focusing more towards the C slash D neighborhoods right on the border of C, D and trying to find opportunity zones. Do you think I can create A properties for investors that, that just people flock to in a C, D neighborhood? Um, I, th I think... Uh... This may, maybe this answers your question, maybe it doesn't, and feel free to <clears throat> re, uh, respond or ask more detail. Um, if you can find a way to make a high quality, affordable product for a reasonable price, you will make more money than you can possibly fathom. The biggest challenge that we have now, to your point, is quality for a reasonable price. That's the problem. Um, we i'll give you an example i have a i have an asset in concord north carolina that's 2000 vintage and it was it's workforce housing it was it's uh, laminate countertops nice wood cabinets um you know vinyl vinyl floors laminate floors when they built it and that's really how they were building stuff in the early 2000s and, and late 90s they did not take apartments over the top uh certainly not in a, in a place like north carolina or, or atlanta um, and we acquired that asset for 62,000 a unit. We just were told that it's, it's worth high one hundreds a unit. And we bought it in 2015. That price increase and what we're able to charge renters, we have doubled the rent for people. Now we are doing upgrades, we're adding granite and, and vinyl plank flooring and, and new uh, fixtures and the units look great, but that neighborhood used to be really affordable and we are actively pushing people out of that neighborhood now that's the business and that's how it works but um if you could put that product new today with regular vinyl flooring and regular laminate countertop countertops and black appliances white appliances and you could rent it for what people were renting it for in 2015 you would have a line out your door and I think that's the real thing that we're trying to solve right now. And some of it is with modular construction and some of it was 3D printing construction, but that's the real challenge. And, and COVID has just put an absolute 
nail in the coffin of that with delays and the price of wood and the price of all these materials is things are just getting more and more expensive to build. We're not building these luxury class A deals all over the place in Atlanta because it's what people necessarily want. It's because you can't build anything without charging a massive rent because of the construction costs. So I think the answer to the question is yes, I totally agree. If you can find a way to do that, providing high quality homes in decent markets is to me the thing that we're missing. We've got plenty of luxury, you know, two to three buck a foot housing in Atlanta. There's plenty of it. What we don't have is great housing between a buck and a buck fifty a foot. We don't have it. And and okay. if you had that, you could just I mean, you'd have a line out and around the door, but uh, I just don't, if somebody could find a way around that issue, I would be all over it. I think that's the future is, you know, finding someone like an Elon Musk who can come in and say, no, you're going to change the way you build everything. And this is how you make it quality, but inexpensive so that you can, you can charge less rent. And, and we're, we're looking constantly for how to do that. Um, but it's a real challenge, but yeah, to answer your question, I absolutely think that if you can do that, you will have tremendous success. All right. I, you know what, Steve, I really appreciate your answer and I appreciate your thoroughness uh, because it was complete and I like it. And I think there, the solution is the very thing that is kind of our nemesis at this moment that changed our timeline of 2019. And that's the current administration. And we see it a lot here in California and they've come up with some really good ideas. And like, for instance, in this 43 apartment unit complex that I'm looking at, it's three stories. The challenge is that the units are too small. For the rent that they pay right it just doesn't quite work if you do it in a traditional apartment style but if you make the bottom floor transitional housing and you make the top floor furnished housing and you make the mid floor regular housing all of a sudden you change the dynamics you know because part of the city thing is you got to have somebody there but you kind of turn it into a hotel slash apartment building which makes these class d properties profitable because you have transitional housing that's funded by the government and so if you would be willing to do some uh, strategy sessions with me, I would love to further talk about this because I really think that is the answer to transitional housing. It's the answer to making properties in D neighborhoods be built for D neighborhoods and be profitable for the investors. And uh, that's my passion. And I really appreciate listening to what you've had to say. No, I, I totally agree. I, I think one of the things as uh, we see constantly that we got out of, um, and, and Max, you'll, you, you know exactly what I'm talking about, is a, a, an older, a older deal that, um, you know, we acquire many older D, D deals, uh, C deals, and say, wow, we can get these at a really low price and we can put a ton of money in them, really improve the tenant quality and give people a good living environment. And if you can't execute that perfectly, you can really slow the entire process down, hurt, kill your returns. And it all comes down to cost and it all comes down to being able to provide a high quality product. And one of the major issues in those C neighborhoods is they're actually not really C neighborhoods. They're, you know, they're C product there. And eventually you're going to have to do something with that C product. And that either means completely renovate it and spend a ton on it or tear it down because it's just not really in a livable condition anymore. And, and some of the mistakes that we, we think are coming is, you know, some of these 60s, 70s, 80s assets are being bought and, hey, I'm going to put a half million dollars into it. Uh -huh. it's nowhere near enough. You got to put a lot more and really improve it and give somebody a nice quality product. You can't just put lipstick on the pig um, to use a Southern saying for everybody here and, and try to pass it off as, as a great place to live. Um, consumers are a single consumer may not be very smart, but consumers are brilliant and they're not going to fall for it. So that, I totally agree. I would agree with that because the new builds you can build purposely for what people want today. And you're not starting from zero. And I can also get a 3D you know, rendering and I can get a 3D economics and know exactly what it's going to cost before I go in where remodels, we just don't know. And that, that bodes exactly to this invitation because they come in every budget they give me. I'm almost, I'm going 30 and 40% over it because the people making the budget are like superintendents that don't know what they're talking about, which again, bodes to the things that you talked about tonight. 
that they look at it, they think this is what they see, and then a contractor goes in and goes, well, heck no, you can't do it for that price. You can't do it for that price. That's the problem with remodels, and that's where in this environment, I believe new builds and flat ground in C slash D neighborhoods is money if you do it right. But thank you very much. I really appreciate your cautions and all of that stuff. It's good stuff. Thanks, George. Thanks, Steve. Okay, Darnell, you're up. Uh, hi, Steve. Uh, thank you for your time this evening. Uh, what I want to ask is uh, you mentioned earlier about some challenges with the uh, property management company as it relates to uh, value-add opportunities, uh, following through on those. Um, exactly how did you navigate that? Um, specifically, I think, uh, and I say this a lot, I, I think it's all about expectation. Um, so, and I think it depends on where you are in the cycle. Has it failed and are you in trouble on an asset or are you just getting started and you're looking to set the, set the stage correctly, right? If, if you're failed and you're in trouble, I mean, the first thing you got to analyze is, is can you, can you turn it around? And if that's the case, it, I think it's instantly about communication and, and getting on all the parties necessary on board to having a weekly call if it needs to be weekly, Monday and Friday until you fix the problem and making sure that you, you create some sort of a working environment so that you have some very specific tasks, very specific goals, and that everybody's agreed on what those goals and tasks are. Um, that's the exact same approach I would use if you're at the beginning. But if you're at the beginning of the process, obviously there's much less stress. And generally, one of the one of the things that as an operator, that's a real challenge is we, we do have some clients that want to we meet weekly and we understand why everybody wants to meet weekly. But sometimes what we find is we're spending a lot of time preparing for a call and preparing to have all the answers when we could be working on the asset. Um, having said that, I think the response to that would be all that extra prep time is making sure that we adhere to those those specific weekly goals. So I think there's a benefit to just making sure that whether it's biweekly or weekly or monthly, that you have the goals set and that you've got that communication together to make sure that everybody knows exactly what their, uh, their responsibilities are and exactly what the expectation is. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you for that. I don't see any other hands up. Anybody else got questions before I interject some of my own? There you go. All right, so Mary, you're up first, and then David, you can go after that. Steve. Steve. I'm sorry. Maybe un unmute the other device, Mary. I see two devices. Sorry. There you so go. To piggyback off for um, Danielle, I was just saying, who's picking the material? The property management or or the asset when it comes down to the material? You're muted, Steve. I'm sorry, you said the materials, like the materials for a renovation? Yes. Yeah, and I think... Um, this actually kind of goes back to Darnell's question a little bit. It doesn't really matter. And we've actually done it both ways. All that matters is that both groups know who is doing it. Um, we have several clients who say, hey, we want you to run with this. We trust you. Just tell us what you're going to do and let us take a look and approve it. We have other groups who say, we're going to pick it and we just want you to execute it. And we have other groups that say, we trust you. Go for it. You don't even have to tell us what you're doing. So I think it's it's more about that someone is doing it than who, and we've done it all three different ways. Thanks. Sure. David? Thanks, Mary. Yes, Steve. Um, so are you open to um, sponsoring deals? And if so, uh, what are you looking for as far? I mean, you pretty much told us a lot of your criteria but in detail, what are you looking for? So when we come across these assets, we can bring it to the table. Um, I'd say that the way that the way that we approach assets right now is we, we like to do at the deals that are 100 units or larger. Um, and that's mostly from a managerial efficiency standpoint. Um, we find that 
the smaller a property is, the less efficient it can be. It doesn't mean that we wouldn't do one. Um, you know, I try to be very careful when I say, well, we don't do this or we don't do that. The reality is if somebody brought me 14 units, that was a steal, I, I would do it if I thought there was a ton of money to be made. Having said that, you know, the, the universe of properties is so vast that you try and narrow your, your um, focus. So we try to stick between 100 and 400 units. And obviously, um, that, that comes with different dynamics. Uh, 400 unit property would be something that we would, we would joint venture with a larger partner or partners on. And sometimes 100 unit property may be something that we could do ourselves or with our own group of investors. Um, we right now are focused on, um, uh, I wouldn't say A locations, but I'd say good locations. Everybody has their different definition of A, B, C, but we're focused on good locations and we're keeping a very close eye on collections. We're still having a difficult time with evictions right now. So one of the stories that we're actually trying to stay away from is, hey, we've got this great property in this great location. The problem is it's got a 25% delinquency. Um, we think that there's going to be a lot of that going on and we're already starting to see some of it and, um, maybe it's, you know, 10% instead of 25. Right. But when we see that, uh, one of the things that we're trying to be cautious with is the idea that, um, I can do that better than you. Uh, we're not sure that we have the ability to collect money better than anyone else. We think we probably can, but let's, let's just say that the, the threat of eviction, which is still not really back yet, even though it's allowed, the the um, municipalities are so far behind that we're not able to use that as a threat nearly as much, is something that we're being very cautious about. In two months, if we get through the, the you know, the pig through the Python and evictions are operating as normal, I would totally change that answer. But I think we're focused on high quality uh, locations um, the assets don't necessarily have to be high quality, but age is something that we're paying attention to. Um, and, and I think that's the, that's the general criteria that we're, that we're focused on. We, we believe that there's that quality matters right now and that a quality asset and a quality location can outperform. Thank you. Appreciate it. But also, okay. are you open to new construction as well? Yeah, we're actually developing. Um, we have a couple properties that we're developing right now, so we're we're definitely open to new construction, particularly in the right places. W one of the hacks we think is available right now is if you can get a piece of land for a really low price, you can actually build to very profitable numbers. Um, and sometimes that means finding a piece of land or a place to build that other people haven't thought of, so that you can keep your land basis way down. Right, one and buying obvious multifamily land right now is really expensive, but if you can find a piece of dirt and maybe get it rezoned or uh, an assemblage, um, we think there's a lot of, of value to create right now. Thank you. Okay, so just raise a hand as we're going. I'm going to throw in some questions here, and part of it is to go on what has been said already. So, for example, Steve, what what kind of return do you think your investors are looking for at this point in time would be one question. And then follow up that with the idea of what it really costs to manage a smaller asset. For example, if our students are underwriting a 50 unit, what would that cost? What, what kind of management expenses? And remember, there's a management fee that we put into our underwriting, and then there's a payroll amount we put into our underwriting. And, and what's your perspective of that? Because that's, that's exactly what you do every day. Sure. The investor question is, is really all over the board. You know, I, I think it's really determined by the, the high quality or the, or excuse me, the, the quality of the asset that they're investing in. We still have plenty of investors that are looking for 20 IRRs and we're basically telling them we don't think those exist right now. Um, most of our investors are still looking for something in the double digits. So if you can show something a 10 or above, they will look, that doesn't always mean they'll do it. But the reality is when you're, when you're buying things at three and four caps, that's a pretty good return um, where that where that cap rate is. So um, that's that's to answer that question in regards to the expenses, as I mentioned briefly before, you know, the smaller the, the property, the less efficient it gets. And so on a 50 unit property, to answer your question, 
Uh, we try to keep payroll costs around 1200 a unit for the assets that we manage, which is why we try to stay at 100 or 100 to 400 units because you can be a little more efficient with your staff. Um, when you have a 50 unit property, your your payroll is going to tend to be closer to 2000 a unit if you have a full time manager and a full time maintenance person. Having said that, for 50 units, you don't really need a full time manager and maintenance person. So your best bet and why we tend to stay away from the smaller properties is your best bet is to hire a local manager that has multiple assets in the area so that they can have a manager that can be devoted to three assets instead of just yours or two assets instead of just yours. So I'd say as opposed to what you're expecting on cost, it's can you find the right manager that that has an expertise in assets of that size? You know, there are several management companies in the Atlanta area that specialize in in-town smaller assets, 10 units, 15 units in, in very urban locations great locations in Atlanta and some older assets that just, you know, aren't 200 units. And because they have such, such a deep bench of, of people that are local and they have so many assets that they manage in an area, they can be extremely efficient and almost as efficient as we can be on a 200, 300 unit property, uh, managing to keep that payroll low. Other than payroll, all of your other costs should be right about the same, you know, taxes, insurance, repairs and maintenance, other things like that. That's really on a per unit expense basis. There's no reason that your utilities or your, your repairs and maintenance or your unit turn costs should be any higher on a smaller property than a larger property. But what we do find is they are because it's just less um, uh, efficient to run them. You know, even, even a vendor that you have coming out, we have vendors that get on a two, 300 unit property, you can keep a vendor busy for an entire day uh, anytime they come out because of all the units you have. On a 15 unit property, you're rarely going to have the ability for a vendor to come out and do more than one thing at a time in your property. And that trip cost is going to cause their quotes to be a little bit higher. So I think it's, it's just an, an efficiency number. And that's why I think what we would recommend for the smaller units is finding that local group, or maybe that's somebody entrepreneurial starting one that their focus is managing 10 units. I, I know there are a lot of single family home managers now that are starting to get into that crossing both single family home managers going and managing small apartment units and small apartment unit managers also managing single family because the same kind of dynamics apply. And if you can get, it's what the institutional groups are doing um, in buying all those houses. If you can get enough houses in the same area, you can be extremely efficient in running them. If you got a thousand houses within, you know, two miles of another, you can put your office right in the middle of them and have a team of maintenance guys and a team of leasing people right there. And it's, it's like running one giant thousand unit property. So in your management company, will you, uh, will you manage the construction and what fee do you charge for that? So say it's a value add and there's upgrades to be done and, and someone's hiring your property management company. Um, I'm, I, I know you, so I'm assuming there's an additional cust, uh, construction management fee and kind of how do you handle that? Yes. Yeah, so if, if someone wants us to, uh, manage value add upgrades or manage, you know, new construction uh, at a property or, you know, new roofing, whatever that is beyond the normal repairs and maintenance. We typically charge a 5% fee to oversee those projects. Um, that's generally on a management basis. So if, if we are the owners, we typically charge an asset management fee on the entire deal that kind of covers all of the work we would do of that kind. So it, it really depends on the structure, but those are the two ways we do it. Okay, and then what I wanted to do was make a list of different sort of uh, gray items that maybe you had come in contact with over the years where an owner is asking you to do as a property manager where you're either like, no, that's an asset manager job or a prop property management job. I only came up with a couple here. But how about quarterly report to investors? Is that asset management job or property manager job? That's a that's a both, but that sounds more like an asset manager job. You know, I think it depends on what's in that report. But a report to investors is typically going to be something that focuses on cash flow and returns and yields. And I that's beyond the scope of, of generally what a property manager is going to provide. Got it. Although I do know I was on a property you managed and you did produce that report. So I just want to throw that in there. Okay, we did, and then, we did both on the one that we did for you. So we kind of, that's one of the nice things of being able to do both is you can kind of do one report that does everything as opposed to, you know, most of the property management reports are 
our financials, budget variance reports, rent rolls, here's what's going on with the property, but the bigger picture of where do we need to take this? What kind of upgrades do we need to do next? And how many do we do? And how much are we willing to invest in them? That's where I'd say it starts to become asset management. Okay. Responsibility for returns, asset manager or property manager? Asset manager. Okay. Um, what other gray areas do you feel like over the years you've had to push back on where you're like, hey, I know you hired us as a property manager, but now you're pushing us into asset management. What have any other things come to mind? Yeah, I think, you know, insurance is one of those that is very, that's an asset manager responsibility, though you have a lot of property managers have, you know, large accounts and great relationships with insurance providers, and they can provide that because they've got such a big book of business that they can get better insurance rates than the owner. But that's, you know, cost of insurance and effectiveness of insurance is an asset management responsibility. Um, one of those gray areas would be, um, tax assessments and and appraisals and um, um, you know going to the the board of equalization with with an appeal of taxes uh, that's an asset management function but often you you find that go well why didn't you as property manager appeal our, our taxes and that's not something that that I would I would consider um, lender repairs as required by a loan that's a real gray area most of property managers do that, but if they're not made aware of it by their owners or asset managers, how is they, how are they going to do that? Um, I can tell you a lot of times there's a phone call, you know, 30 days before these lender repairs are due to a property manager or, or vice versa from the lender to the property manager saying, Hey, are these repairs going to be done in time? And no one's made aware of them. Um, so I'd say a lot of stuff, anything with a lender, uh, whether it's a lender inspection, insurance inspection, things like that are, are often a gray area. Um, what kind of clients over the years, as you built your property management business and your asset management business, what types of clients have you decided to move away from? Mean ones. How does uh, that, what would that look like in your business when you say that? Uh, it's not even really a business thing. It's, um, I hope it's okay to say, but life is too short to do business with assholes. That's my opinion. And I've had to do it a long time. And eventually you get to a point where you just say, I'm not going to do it anymore. I don't care how valuable or how profitable you are. Um, life is too short. So that's, that's more of a personal thing than it is a business strategy. But I found that the more I do that, the more successful my business is. Um, and that's, you know, it's 80, 20 rule. Uh, we've, we found, we found that's true with assets. You know, this year we sold three assets and those three assets that we sold were 80% of our problems. Now we still have a ton of problems because it's property management and, and investing. You always have problems and issues you got to solve, but it's pretty easy to take a step back and look at the whole picture and go, who are, who are the people that treat me the worst and treat our staff the worst and treat our vendors the worst? Who are the tenants that treat our staff the worst? Who are the vendors that are the least reliable? What are the properties that are the most difficult to deal with? And we found that if you start to remove those things, things just get a little bit better. And there is a book titled that, believe it or not. I'm going to type it into the chat. This is the actual title of the book. You guys can see it on the chat. Um, but it was a, an organization, a company that came up with a rule and it was the no asshole rule. And that's the title of the book too. You can read. And it's a, um, we use values in our organization, right? So we right. use our values to, to work on that and, and to try to address those issues. Okay. I can't so remember. There's, there's a motivational speaker or business advisor who tells a great story and I'm going to botch it, but I'm sure you can Google it. And he basically says, you know, the Navy SEALs have a, a way that they pick Navy SEALs and it's a, 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 talent scale and a trust scale and um or you know talent performance you know performance and trust and that you'd think they'd want someone that's maximum performance but the reality is um, every organization has somebody that is a super high performer but it's just not the best person and he he has a really funny story where he says if all you have to do is walk into the organization and go who's the asshole and everybody points to the same guy and that that's kind of what we're we're looking to get past and, and create really high trust and just make sure that once you meet that minimum threshold for performance, it's all about trust. Um, 
you know, and I guess what the Navy SEALs would probably say is once you're qualified to be a Navy SEAL, at that point, we don't need you to be the best Navy SEAL. We need you to be the most trustworthy Navy SEAL. And that's kind of our approach and what we're, we're looking to do. Okay. We have a couple minutes left. You're a couple or more decades into this multifamily business, investing and property management and asset management. What kind of advice would you give a newbie, somebody way back at the beginning of the journey? What, looking back over your time, what would be something you might be able to say to a new person entering this industry? Um, I would say timing is everything. And, um, I'd say when I was very young, I thought that, you know, timing didn't matter. Don't try to time the market, just be really good. And you can make money even when the market's bad. And, and I still think that's true, but I remind a lot of people that, um, I, I said it earlier, I think in this, in this chat that any idiot buying apartments in 2012 was going to make money. And at some point you're going to find out who really knows what they're doing. And so I would invest in, um, uh, get the reps necessary, um, and not worry quite as much about the money at, at first, if you're looking to get in, worry about the expertise. And if you can build the expertise and have good timing, uh, get a good sense for when the market's moving the right way for you and the right time to buy a particular asset. I mean, there's a couple assets that, that we've been involved in twice and made money twice on them just because our timing was good. Um, so I think that's, that's probably what I would say is, is focus on expertise, focus on knowledge and, and focus on timing and, and don't focus on, you know, we meet, I meet a lot of people who are, I'm, I'm bad at deals. I got to do deals. I got to do deals and try to get that, try to get that out of your head and try to get in the mode of, I got to do good deals. Um, I think the best advice I ever got from one of my mentors was the best deal you ever do is the one you don't do. Okay. Okay, so with that, that's an awesome place to end. We got four minutes left. David, you got to go quick. The rest of us start to move back to the forum to down to the rate and wrap area. And while we're doing that, David, ask your question. Okay, two, two quick questions. First question is, um, do you dabble in any um, commercial um, type properties, um, whether it's office or retail? And then the second question would be, what's the best advice for somebody who owns smaller fourplex type unit um, properties to scale up, um, what would you say to do? Um, I, I invest in commercial and other forms of real estate as an individual, uh, but not as Arkin. We, we like to keep Arkin very specifically focused on expertise in one particular thing. So that's multifamily investing, investing and operating. Um, uh, for someone starting that wants to get bigger, that's doing fourplexes and smaller units, I would say that there is a huge value in partnership. You know, you can get, I, I know several groups that are 10 times the size that I am that all started with, you know, random groups of people just pooling their money and getting together. And, you know, it's better. I, I have felt like it's better to own 1% of a bunch of really big deals than 100% of a bunch of small ones that helps me diversify across a, a large group and and do slightly more institutional stuff so if you're really looking to ramp up maybe the best way to ramp up is with the same amount of size but it's a smaller percentage of a larger deal and then eventually you can get a larger percentage of the larger deals gotcha thank you okay. thank awesome. you for your time steve thank, thank you, you guys thank you steve okay uh everybody unmute <laughs> uh george start with you and read down what's your score nine oh, before you do before you do remember the, the scoring system here we're rating the meeting not the person remember that a seven and below requires an explanation and an eight and above does not and what we're really trying to do at this part of the meeting is just to identify any topics that we need to cover later you don't ever want to leave a meeting thinking you didn't get to say your piece okay okay george is a nine thank you sarah pedro Oh, nine. Nice. Cabron? Nine as well. Got it. Mary? Nine. Larry? Nine. Thanks. Max is a nine. I'm a nine. Darnell? Nine. Dave? Uh, I give it a ten. Great meeting. 
Nice. Thanks, sir. Anybody missed? You always miss me, Charmaine. Okay, you guys. Uh, so Charmaine. Go. Oh. Ten. <laughs> nice. Thanks, Charmaine. Thanks for speaking up. Okay, you guys. Um, we got one minute left. I want you all to send me an address of a property you're underwriting over the next week, and I'm going to send you a co-star report for it, okay? Because I want you to dig into those properties a little bit deeper, and I want you to look at that additional data that can help you go to that next level, okay? All right, you guys. Thank you. Have a great week. I appreciate you all. Happy New Year. Thanks, Thank Amy. you, guys. See you guys Happy next week. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. See you next week. See you next week. See you guys. Thank you. Thank you.